42. Here we are at the last chapter of this wonderful book, the book of Job. Job chapter 42. So let's, let's read it together then. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, things which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thy unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Baldad the Shunite, and so far the Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and had ate bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a 1,000 yoke of oxen and a 1,000 she-asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Kezia and the name of the third Kernehapuk. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job an hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old and full of days. Amen. And we know the Lord will bless to us the reading of his precious precious word. The title of the message this evening that I've uh, felt just to pen was simply Job's restoration and Satan's ultimate defeat. Job's restoration and Satan's ultimate defeat. It's wonderful as Christians to have God's last chapter written for us, to encourage us in his word. As Christians, we have the Bible, something that Job never had. And as we read the Word of God and we read the Revelation of John, uh, in, in the book of Revelation, there we have the last chapter, and we as believers know how it's going to end. We have that blessed privilege, but Job, he had no Bible. This man, just his faith in a just God, that's all he had. And when we think about that, it really encourages our hearts to see the depth and the strength 
of this man's faith, his faith in God, his trust in the living God. And we see here as we have uh, went through these various studies, I know the, the last one has come somewhat, there's been quite a gap from we did the last one, but when we look at this in light of what we have learned before, it's staggering and amazing uh, at what Job has come through, how God has brought him through, and what we have learned. And it's been a blessing to me as I have studied it, and I'm sure it's been a blessing to you as you have listened to the services and the messages. And so we want to look tonight at this closing chapter. You know, sure, you could take a year preaching on the book of Job and you still never would exhaust it. But we want to bring it to a conclusion this evening. And in verse 42, uh, verses 1 to 6, we have here Job's humble submission to God. Job's a humbled man now at the end of this. God has humbled him as he has seen the mighty power of God as God gave him a revelation there in the previous chapters as God spoke into his heart and revealed his mighty wisdom to Job and it humbled Job uh, humbled him so much that he said he, he repented in sackcloth and in ashes that was an, an old uh, tradition of mourning uh, mourning over his sin and he humbled himself before his God and that's one of the the most important lessons no man can come to Christ except he humble himself no woman can come to Christ except they humble themselves under the mighty hand of God and here we could even go in to the gospel tonight even in this these first six verses so we see here uh, Job's submission to God Job's repentance on submission of his pride and uh, of his rebellion, he, he had answers for God. And uh, whenever the Lord revealed himself, he realized that he was rebellious and had a proud heart. And you know, we're all like that. Uh, before we come to Christ, we were rebellious sinners with a proud heart before God. But God humbles us and deals with our pride. Verse 3, we see here Job's. Job acknowledged God's ways are too deep for his understanding. He said that, Who is he that hideth counsel, verse 3, without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. We only think we have the answers. We only think we know. We think we're clever. We think we're smart. We think we know better than God. But we have no answers to the almighty Wisdom, who can fathom the depths of the knowledge and of the wisdom of God? And Job had received that revelation. He said before, I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ears, but now I have seen thee. He got spiritual uh, eyesight. So Job's declaration here of, of uh, God's majestic holiness and wisdom, verse 4 and 5, he says, Here I beseech thee. And I will speak, I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Before he had an intellectual, if you like, understanding of spiritual matters, but now he has received heart revelation. He knows from deep experience uh, what he has went through. These lessons have, have taught Job so much and uh, made him a spiritual man and here he acknowledges the, the majestic holiness and wisdom and might of almighty God he says indeed that I have uh, now seen thee and now mine eye saith thee he received spiritual revelation spiritual illumination and I believe as well, spiritual information from God. Wonderful truths that this man, Job, had received from the Lord. And as a result of seeing the glory of God and the revelation that he received, he realized that he was just mere dust in the sight of a holy God. You know, sometimes we think we are something. We think we are somebody's. 
uh, you know, in light of others, but this man, Job, he realized in the eyes of God he was nothing. And uh, absolutely nothing and that God is everything. So, the next thing we want to see here is God's wrath is kindled against the three friends for the words of judgment that were not true. Now, all the book, all the book of Job and the deliberations from his four friends, there's only three of them mentioned here, it wasn't that all that they spoke was not true, but these men were looking at Job's situation from a human viewpoint and not from God's, and that was the problem. They were trying to understand it from human viewpoint, and we looked at that, and they don't understand the deep things or the deep ways of God. And that's a danger for us uh, to make judgments when we don't know all the facts as God knows, and we can get it wrong. And so God is coming now with a glorious vindication for Job. And I have seen that in my own experience over the years when God has passed judgment uh, on myself. And uh, you can seek to counteract that and fight your corner, as it were. But if you just leave it and let God work it out, and He will vindicate truth and He'll vindicate His servants. And so, as a result of that, we see here that God is, he's angry. He says in verse 7 that my wrath is kindled against thee. This was these, uh, these men who had got it so wrong and God was angry. And so, dear friends, there's a lesson there for each and every one of us. Uh, the scripture says, the Lord Jesus says, every idle word that as Christians we speak shall be given account of. If it's not repented of, we, we'll give an account of that. God records our life as believers and what we say. He's, as the little text says, he's the, the silent guest at the table, the unseen guest. He's there, he's listening, he's recording. And so God's angry. But we see here the privilege of Job's position. The privilege of Job's position in verses 78, because Job... Uh, he says that he's, he's my servant, God said. Four times in these two verses, God is vindicating Job. He says he's my servant in spite of his feelings, in spite of the things that he, that he said under severe satanic pressure and uh, persecution and affliction. I mean, look what this man lost. Look what he went through mental suffering, physical suffering, deep spiritual anguish. And he said things in there that, that just won't true, but God didn't deny him. God didn't forsake him. God didn't leave him. God still acknowledged he's my servant. And that takes us right back to the opening verses in Job where he said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. And when Job was in his, his darkest hour and in his deepest darkness, he was still God's servant. Even though he didn't feel it, even though he couldn't sense it, even though he couldn't understand it, he was still God's servant. That's a tremendous encouragement for you and I tonight. That whatever situation we're in as children of God, we're still his servants. That's a blessing. And then the New Testament, the Lord Jesus in John 15, Texas, a little bit further, he calls us friends. Isn't that marvelous? Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. I don't call ye servants any longer. I call you friends. What an intimate relationship that God has brought us into. So that's the privilege of Job's position. He was still God's servant. And he's still God's friend. And then we see also the power of Job's prayers. The power of Job's prayers. 
In verse 8, he had uh, commanded these three men what they were to do. They were to take uh, seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you. There we see the power of Job's prayers. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a man like that praying for you? What a blessing to have your name on Job's prayer list to know that Job was praying for you. I have had many godly people who have put me on their prayer list and prayed for Mandy and I and our family for years and they're in the glory tonight. They're with Christ, which is far better. And that's one thing I miss, uh, is the prayers of those dear saints of God. But the Lord has been pleased to answer and been pleased to bless. Job shall pray for you, for him I will accept. Isn't that lovely? For him will I accept. But tonight... We have a greater one than Job praying for us. We have the Son of God, the Lord Jesus. And John reminds us that in his, in his first letter uh, in John 2. He's our advocate. Our advocate. He's, he's our great high priest. He's the one that sits at the Father's right hand and prays for us. Prays for you. And prays for me to the Father. Isn't that awesome? The sinless one, the spotless one, the holy one, the only begotten one, praying for you and for me. What would he be praying for? Well, that our faith fail not, as he did for Peter. That's one of the things. Amongst the many, praise God tonight, we have a greater than Job praying for you and for me. So he says, take these seven bullocks and these seven rams and offer them as a burnt offering. You see, the burnt offerings in the Old Testament, out of all of the offerings, you had the peace offering, which represented Christ, peace with God. But the burnt offering was a free will offering. And the burnt offering, the whole offering was placed on the altar of sacrifice, which is a picture of, of the consecration of the believer, the total giving over of oneself to God. And when that sacrifice is on the altar, every part, every piece, nothing held back, the fire of God comes, not on the altar, but on the sacrifice. And that's a picture of total consecration. So uh, these men were totally yielding to the perfect will of God and giving themselves wholly over. Because I believe as they had looked at Job's life and God had given these men this revelation, they learned a lot of lessons too. Not just Job, but these men. They learned a lot of lessons too. And we could do a Bible study on that. But they learned a lot of truth. Just as we're learning from Job's experience, we can learn and glean from other people's experience and here we see then Job his intercession and supplication for his friends and also uh, for himself and this is important so here we see then verse 9 in the middle of the verse it says and did according as the Lord commanded them. So they did. They offered the sacrifices. They brought them to Job. Job prayed for them. And they were brought into the right relationship again with Job and also with God. And there's a lovely, there's a lovely little phrase here that could be lost or missed. It says, the Lord also accepted Job. The Lord also accepted Job. His intercession and supplication was for his friends and for himself. And I'm sure as Job prayed that prayer, he included himself 
in that category. It wouldn't have been a judgmental prayer. It wouldn't have been a vindictive prayer. We don't know the content of the prayer, but you can rest assured Job, as he prayed for his three brethren, as his three friends, just like Jeremiah and Daniel when they're praying and interceding for the land, they were including themselves in the prayer. He didn't exclude himself. He knew he needed forgiveness as well. And so the Lord also accepted Job. And that's what it says. The Lord also accepted Job when he prayed. And verse 10 says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. That's very significant. When he prayed for his friends. The deliverance of Job in relation to his friends. There's no pride in this man anymore. All pride is gone. He could have took the moral high ground and said, well, I'm not praying for you and just left them in persecution and under the wrath of God. But he had learned the lessons. Through his experiences, he had learned pride was gone. There was no room for rebellion anymore. There was no room for being arrogant. He was a total obedient man and he prayed for his friends and what I see in this here is here we see the power of forgiveness at work the power of forgiveness at work this is a a deep deep spiritual truth I did mention it there one other Sunday morning in Mark's gospel chapter 10 on verse 24 about the power of forgiveness uh, Mark eleven twenty four, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye sh- receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses trespasses and here we see the blessed power of forgiveness at work this is a spiritual truth in the old testament and in the new testament and if we want to receive the blessing of god which we do we need to forgive what i have discovered um, god will bless the preaching of his word but i want god to bless me as well I want God's blessing on my life. I want God's blessing on on my family. I want my prayers to be answered. Yes, God has promised to bless his word. Where it's preached and where it's read, he'll bless his word. But I want to be blessed as well. And so therefore, I don't want anything in my life that would hinder, restrict, or hold back the blessing of God. And, And forgiveness plays such a big, big part in the life of the believer. We never, ever get beyond the point where we're not told to forgive. We will always have to forgive. That's the teaching. Peter asked the Lord Jesus, how many times have I got to forgive this man? Seven times. The Lord Jesus said 70 times seven. In other words, every time. That's the teaching. And so it says, And the Lord accepted Job's prayers. He accepted his prayers because he prayed in the right spirit. He prayed in the right spirit. He prayed with a heart of forgiveness and with a heart of love. This man was serious in his prayer life and the Lord accepted Job's prayers it doesn't give you the detail of what he prayed but it says here very clearly and categorically when he prayed for his friends friends first those that had ridiculed him accused him 
made accusations about his lifestyle, said there was sin in his life. If that would happen to you and to me, how would we react? And we pray, Lord, deal with them. Lord, get the stick out and beat the life out of them. Lord, bring them to their knees. Give them a thorny pillow. Give them a thorny bed. That is soulish praying. That's of the flesh. Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So what you're praying for others, if the Lord was to answer that prayer in your own life, would you be blessed? Would you be blessed? Because the Lord says we're to pray for our enemies. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now I know this is a challenge, but this is scripture. So when he prayed for his friends, the blessing came. Job's prayers for his friends and his forgiveness of them for all the hurt and the pain they caused him and their false accusations it released them this is the lovely thing about God it released them into God's blessing because until Job prayed for them they were under the wrath of God they were under God's wrath, he was, it was kindled against them and it was Job's responsibility to pray. And friends, it's our responsibility today to pray. And the Lord Jesus said that, pray for those who despitefully use you and abuse you. And whenever you can pray for your enemies and mean it, you have really forgiven them. Really. When you can pray for them, those that have hurt you, and we all have them. When we can do that, we have really forgiven them. That's a, that's a fact. And so, these prayers of Job's, Job's forgiveness was releasing these people into the blessing of God. And it also released himself. It released himself. Job's fortunes were restored when he prayed for his friends. Didn't the Lord Jesus cry from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness is the first step in healing and restoration. I remember recently a conversation I heard about a certain individual who had uh, a lot of hurt in her life as a result of her mother's abuse, both physical and emotional, deep hurtful words. And whenever this dear person come to the place as a Christian, and she had carried this, this particular person had carried this for years. And whenever they came to the place where they forgive, and released them and got that prayer out uh, the first thing that happened was they ran to the toilet and were violently sick and all this old green bile of bitterness come out green bile of bitterness and unforgiveness was poured out into the toilet pot where it belonged and that individual was released and brought into a wonderful vibrant loving relationship with God that's a fact because this unforgiveness is a green bile bitterness that will destroy your soul but when we deal with it, it releases God's blessing. Unable to pray for them, God bless them as you're blessing me. Do you know how I prayed for those who, who hurt me in my wilderness experience? I prayed, Lord, will you bless them more than you're blessing me? That's how I dealt with it. And I, that released me. I have nothing in my heart 
against one soul. The only person I hate with a vengeance is the devil. And other than that, not another soul. So the deliverance of Job in relation to himself, he forgave him. There's a lesson for every Christian. (laughs) But thank God here from verses uh, 10 to verses 17, there's the end of the season of suffering and sifting. Praise the Lord. Maybe I should do a leap over the pulpit. (laughs) Thank God there's the end of the season. There's seasons in life with God. We, we looked at that, didn't we? And this season for Job had come to an end. After the darkness comes light. After death comes resurrection. And here's Job's resurrection. He's coming out now. This season is over. This chapter is now closed. And God has fulfilled his purposes Uh, through what he wanted to accomplish and God is really blessing this man and going to bless others through him. And so thank God that the end of this season of sifting and suffering is over. The hand of God had released Job, uh, had released in healing Job's health. It says here on verse 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. In other words, God healed him. God healed Job. He permitted Satan to afflict him. God has the hedge around each and every one of us. Whatever comes into our lives, God permits. And God allowed that to happen. But when it's, when it's the final moment, God says, that's it. And he comes, the son of righteousness shall arise, says Micah, with healing in his wings. God heals. God's time had come. God touches he healed Job. He touched him. The hand of God hath touched him. What a, what a wonderful phrase. The hand of God. Speaking of the almighty, omnipotent power of God. Remember when Queen Elizabeth, the coronation, when she's uh, receiving the crown to reign and she holds the golden orb in her hands. Well, that's just, if you like, a picture of God. He's in control of all things. We're in his almighty hand. God says, Heal, heal is you. So the hand of God released in healing Job's health, the hand of God in restoring Job's wealth. It says, Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice as much as he had before. Job was the wealthiest man in the Middle East. At that particular season, he had, he had uh, 7,000 of uh, various types of animals. And in those days, money and wealth wasn't put in a bank. It was on livestock. It was on the hoof. Uh, that was the wealth. And he was the wealthiest man. But as we realized earlier on in the studies, that even though Job possessed wealth, wealth didn't possess Job And God had blessed him with everything he had. And he he prospered his hands. He was industrious. He he was a hard worker. And here we see that God is restoring Job's wealth. And he gave him twice as much as he had before. He's the God of the abundant. He's the God of the abundant. He delights to bless his children. And here he is. He's blessing his servant with twice as much as he had before. God Almighty. He opened up his hand. He opened up the storehouses. And he poured all this blessing. Into Job's life. This was a picture here. Of a prosperity. Uh, in Job's day and generation. Wealth. Picture of prosperity. And here his almighty God. Was blessing him again. With prosperity. It was showing that Job was in favor with God. You remember uh, back in the early verses they said, oh, you're out of favor with God. That's why he stripped you with all things. But, but God, he's given him now here wonderful, wonderful blessings. 
the hand of God in addition to Job's family. In addition to Job's family. And uh, he give Job, verse 13, he had also seven sons and three daughters. He lost seven sons and he lost three daughters. And everything else, he gave him twice as much as he had. Verse 12, uh, he has 14,000 sheep. He has 6,000 camels. And he has 1,000 yoke of action and 1,000 she asses or donkeys. But prior to that, he had just a half of them. But when it comes to his children, he didn't give him 14 sons and 6 daughters. The reason is because those seven sons... And those three daughters are in heaven. They're in the glory. And so he gives them another seven and another three. So he does have twice as much. Hallelujah. <laughs> he does have twice as much. So he, he's 14 children. Direct descendants and six daughters. That's 20. God's no man's debtor. And there's a little spiritual truth in there, isn't there? That, that the soul goes to be with Christ, which is far better. And Job said that he would see them at the latter end, the end of days. So he's adding to Job's family and the hand of God and giving to Job the double portion. The double portion. He gave him twice as much as he had before, the double portion. Isn't it wonderful to have that blessing on your life? The blessing of God's double portion. And that's what the Lord gave to Job. He gave him the double portion. And the hand of God in restoring relationships, verse 11. And we see there the harmony and unity. It says, these is lovely verses. There came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters. That's his family, his immediate family and relations. There's restoration. And all they that had been of his acquaintance before, his friends, those that were uh, associated with him. And look at this. And did eat bread with him in his house. There's fellowship restored. Friendships restored. And they bemoaned him and comforted him and that board bemoaned means consoled they consoled him they encouraged him they put their arm around him this maybe said Job I, I thought you were finished I thought it was all over for you I never seen a man as miserable I never seen a man as afflicted in all my life they consoled him Job can hardly believe uh, what what your faith in God has done you're a stalwart you're 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 an inspiration uh, to your God and they bemoaned him they consoled him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him every man also give him a piece of money there we see their generosity towards him they give him of their substance they give him a bit of money yes it's one thing it's lovely when you can put your arm around someone but sometimes they need a wee bit more than that William Booth says it's no good preaching to men with cold feet and empty bellies and he did a little bit more than put the arm round. He fed their souls. Made them welcome. And God blessed that. And every one an earring of gold. It wasn't just a little bit of money. It was something more precious. Something more dear. Gold was a very precious commodity. They didn't hold back. And they were very liberal in their giving to Job. And I believe that God had stirred their hearts and this was one of the ways that God was going to restore uh, Job's wealth to him through the blessings of his friends. You know, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We had our friend here uh, last Wednesday evening and by the grace of God, he left with over £500 uh, for, the, for to further his work. It's not marvellous that we can help to propagate and to share the love of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus uh, with the Jewish people who blessed us with God's precious word and God's wonderful Messiah. They give their gold.
They give their best to, to this man, Job. And it says, In all the land where no women find so fair as the daughters of Job. And the first name of the one there is Jemima. Jemima. Jemima means in Hebrew, a dove. Symbolical of the blessed Holy Spirit. There's nothing more beautiful than the spirit of the dove in the life of the believer. And it says his daughters uh, that there was no woman in all the land so fair or beautiful as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. There you see the generosity of Job's heart. He didn't make a difference in the children. It was only in the Old Testament law uh, in relation to uh, firstborn rights, if there was no sons left, then the daughters got the sons' inheritance. But here we see Job giving his daughters an inheritance. Such is the heart and the spirit and the love of the man. Oh, what a picture of a man with a heart of love. And uh, I love this here. It says that uh, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. So just to bring the little Bible study to your conclusion tonight, just to summarize briefly that we may be encouraged as we leave this book and take with us the blessings uh, and the truths that we have learned so the summary I have written, Job, the man with no Bible, only faith in his God. The man with no Bible, only faith in his God. Job, the man God used to bless multitudes through his life. One man, Job, and how the book of Job has blessed the church of Jesus Christ. One man. How God used this one man to bless multitudes, multitudes through his life. He doesn't know, he didn't know what he was doing or how God was going to bless him uh, through his sufferings. But if Job wouldn't have went through this experience, if we didn't have the book of Job in the Bible, how would we ever make sense of it? How would it ever make sense of being a Christian? How would we ever make sense of our trials, of our troubles, of our tribulations? Of our How would we ever make sense of it if we didn't have the book of Job? Job, the man who trusted God at all times, he could do no other. One of the most blessed verses is that glorious verse, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's blind, naked faith when you have nothing else, only your hope in God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job, the man who proved God to be faithful and true, and he is. And Job proved the Lord that God is faithful. And that God is true. And I'm sure if Job had the blessing of uh, reading this, this precious word over in his, in his old years, I would say every time he read a chapter, he would have wept at the faithfulness of his God. Job, the man God used to get victory over Satan and over demons. Satan, who was in the highest pinnacle of the angelic host next to the throne of God, who rebelled against the light of truth and brought sin and destruction and devastation into this world. And God raises up a creature of the dust called Job. 
a man that he can trust to rebuke the satanic and the unseen world, that despite everything he would endure, he wouldn't disobey God or let hold of his word, wouldn't let go. What a rebuke to Satan and the powers of darkness. And that encourages you and me tonight, that when the assaults of the enemy and the billows of Satan's wrath would seek to come upon us, that we too, like Job, we can hold on to the God we have not seen by eye, but we know by faith. And we can hold on to his promises, which Job didn't have. And we know that our God's real. Job, the man God molded through adversity, trials, and tribulations, what a sweet saint he was. A molded man. We spoke on Sunday morning about the clay. My, look what God had to do with Job on the potter's wheel. What a vessel he made. What a vessel God made when he took him off the wheel and put him in the furnace of affliction and fired him three times to make him hard and to make him a useful vessel. What a vessel. What a vessel Job was. The man who had to be molded through adversity, trials, and tribulation, the tears that he shed and the suffering that he endured, but he was a vessel unto honor, a mighty man of God. Job, the man whom God could trust through suffering. God can trust many of his people through good days, but can he trust us through suffering? Can he trust us in the tough times of life, in the difficult times of life? Can he trust us? But he could trust this man through suffering. The man whom God could use to fulfill his plan. God had a plan for Job. And God knew, ere he ever give Satan permission to afflict him, that his plan, God's plan, would be fulfilled. That's an encouragement for you and I tonight. God knows what we can endure. God knows the plan for our life. He knows all about what's coming down the road. God has the plan. And if we hold on, he'll fulfill that. Job, the man of integrity in the midst of adversity. He never lost his integrity. His wife says, curse God and die. I ain't going to take no more. I ain't going. I've had enough. I'm finished. That's, that's it over for me. I'm going. But Job held on. He was a man of integrity in the face of adversity. That's some testimony. And Job, the man God used to reveal God's ways and God's love. As for God, the psalmist says, his ways are perfect. It doesn't say they're painless. <laughs> That's for sure. But whatever ways they are, his ways are perfect. Mysterious at times, difficult at times, trying at times, painful at times, but perfect. God knows what he's doing. And as we have the book of Job, we have the blessing of the last chapter. That's awesome. So, this book of Job, the man of God that gives me encouragement and helps me to make sense of suffering and trials in a measure. I don't understand it, stand it all, but in a measure, it gives me a limited understanding uh, as a believer of something of the journey uh, that the Lord has brought us on. And it's great to know that whatever God brings into your life, whatever He permits, He has a purpose and a plan through it all. And finally, my closing words are this. 
In verse 16, I love this wee phrase, after this. Isn't that lovely? After this. Here we have a little glimpse into glory. Little glimpse of heaven. Because there's an after this. There's a heaven and a home for each one of us. This is not it. We're still in the chapters. But when it comes to the last page of our lives, when it comes to the last chapter, when it comes to the last line, when it comes to the last words, there's an after this. Heaven. Home. Eternity. This time of testing, sifting, and suffering is over when we get to heaven it'll be worth it all be worth it all everything we endured after this Job lived a hundred and forty years his days are multiplied he was about 70 when these trials came. And God added another 140 years. You see the double again. When 70 and 140 equals 210 years he lived. And Job died an old man. Full of days. Wouldn't it be wonderful to go round to Grandpa Job's house? Rhonda, tell us about the good old days. Tell us about the good old days. And our son, I heard God's real. Word of God says, tell it to your children's children. What a sweet saint he would have been to sit with. What counsel he could have given you. What wisdom would have flowed from his pure lips. What joy would have been in his heart. What experiences he could have shared. Oh, he knew the love and the presence and the deliverance of God. He enjoyed the blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow thereto. And he died being old and full of days. And when he died, he went home to be with the ancient of days. And that's our destination too. When it's over, when this old mortal frame and uh, gives up the ghost, we're going to be with Jesus, going to be with Christ, which is far better. And we'll be able, in the glory, to have conversations with Job and hear from his lips how he proved the Lord, his God. And may that be our encouragement in this our day and in our generation. May Job's life be our encouragement to prove God in our day. Let us pray.